The local short track scene in rural America is the very heart and soul of what racing is all about. Its grassroots environment is an unmatched atmosphere that you have to experience firsthand to get an idea of it. And it serves as a launching pad for careers as young, up-and-coming race car drivers get their feet wet and gain all the knowledge they can to prepare themselves for the long road to becoming a household name in stock car racing, or whatever path they choose. That's what NASCAR legend Rusty Wallace from St. Louis, Missouri did. And not only did he blaze through that path, he put on a master class in it. Grinding his way through the Midwest short track landscape, conquering series like USAC and ASA, winning track championships in Florida, and next thing he knew, he was outdoing budding superstars like Mark Martin, Dick Trickle, and Alan Kowicki. By then, it was a formality that all the intangibles he developed from the short track scene would instantly translate to the highest level in the NASCAR Winston Cup Series. But everyone comes from short tracks. What made him special? It was his dedication to learning the ins and outs of how the car worked and communicating exceptionally with his team. He was fully committed to getting the chassis setups to his liking, not leaving any stone unturned, understanding the mechanics of what made his cars better than everyone else's, and shining the spotlight on him, allowing him to be snagged by whatever NASCAR team that took a chance on him. That team would be the iconic number 88 Gatorade Pontiac for Cliff Stewart in 1984. He would win Rookie of the Year and take off from there on his way to being a yearly contender for the championship. And as far as that short track talent goes, it would be a seamless transition into the NASCAR universe, particularly at none other than Bristol Motor Speedway, the world's fastest half mile. We've covered this track in this series before, but regardless, it needs no introduction. This place is the best of the best when it comes to racing, no matter what level. The natural beating and banging action, spilling over into hot tempers and igniting rivalries is a can't miss spectacle if you call yourself a race fan. Rusty pulled into victory lane nine times here, tied for second all time behind fellow Hall of Famer Darrell Waltrip and enough to have his own part of the facility named after him. That definitely classifies under the category of dominant. Let's get into Rusty's tour through the high banks of this half mile bull ring and the highs and lows, yes there were lows, of the success he carved into the concrete surface. It was a rainy early spring day in 1986 in the Tennessee mountains and keep in mind this was asphalt Bristol. It had a different element to it in this era before the Coliseum days in the late 90s and early 2000s. Driving for Raymond Beetle in the number 27 Pontiac, Rusty took off in 14th in just a 32 car field. The race started under caution to allow time for the track to dry, but once it got underway, Neil Bonnet set the pace and had a stranglehold on the field. But around lap 75, the throttle hung on his car and torpedoed him into the outside wall, leaving him stunned and gathering his wits about him on the backstretch. After all that, the competition opened up, but Rusty was still nowhere to be found. It wasn't until over a hundred laps in that he finally came into the picture and the broadcast took notice. He was putting pressure on Harry Gant and eventually started working his way through the top 10. He got around Darrell Waltrip, then Richard Petty and Dale Earnhardt, and next thing you know, he's a contender for the lead in battle in Terry Labonte. It wouldn't take much longer until he was P1 just before halfway and began to put a gap on the rest of the leaders. However, it would be short-lived. Alan Kowicki and Earnhardt would get together, collecting Labonte. While it was temporary good news that Rusty's top competitors that day were now behind the eight ball, the set of tires he got on the pit stop were not working well with the car. He slid back to second behind Waltrip while allowing Earnhardt to get his lap back. It was clear he needed another yellow to get the car adjusted back to winning shape, and he would get his wish not long after with a single car spin. It wasn't quite dialed in afterwards, but he caught right back up to Darrell and battled him toe to toe for dozens of laps locking everyone's eyes in on the action. Waltrip wouldn't go down easily, but at long last, Rusty was able to power by on the inside and run off and hide. It was a cakewalk from there, and his first ever Winston Cup win was in the bag, and no place more fitting than Bristol. Not only did he dominate the later portion of the race, but went through the best of the sport to get there. He earned a lot of respect that day from those veterans, and he didn't look back. Now before we go any further, I feel like it's necessary to document a rather frightening situation that unfolded just two years later. All the success Rusty was about to experience almost never happened because on this August day in 1988, the Speedway nearly took his life. As practice was underway, his Pontiac cut a tire down causing a terrifying barrel roll down the front stretch in front of everyone. While the crash itself was an alarming visual, what took place inside the cockpit was far worse. Rusty's airway was blocked, in turn cutting off his breathing. As Dale Earnhardt and much admired and respected media member slash medical aide Dr. Jerry Punch rushed to the scene, they discovered Rusty was trapped inside and needed to be extracted by cutting off the roof. 
While Punch was manually holding Rusty's breathing passage open the best he could, the track safety personnel went to sawing and eventually removed him and got him into the ambulance. It was then when he finally started regaining consciousness and becoming more alert on the way to the hospital. After all that commotion, the reason for Rusty's breathing being cut off was due to part of a sandwich he ate just before practice being lodged in his esophagus. Not only did he make a full recovery fairly quickly, he would go on to start the race that weekend before being relieved by another driver. Talk about one tough customer. Everyone would realize that weekend how bad he wanted to compete and win at NASCAR's highest level, regardless of the circumstances. Now with that scary incident behind us, we can get back to the victory tour. It didn't take long at all for Rusty to rebound at the high banked half mile, as the very next visit by the Cup Series would be his next trip to victory lane in the spring of 89. Although he was battling an inner ear infection causing vertigo all weekend, firing up his engine in eighth starting spot would be just the cure he needed. Bristol had just gone through a repave, creating a lot of one groove racing, and on top of that, it had rained the day before, making for a green racetrack. The top groove was basically non-existent. For most of the first half, Rusty just hung in the back half of the top 10 and felt the car out. Around the midway point, he was able to use pit strategy to get the lead, but just for a quick second. He had to dive onto pit road for a flat tire, and as he did, another caution came out, trapping him a lap down. Chaos would ensue as a wreck between Ernie Irvin, Hutch Strickland, and Brett Bodine would nearly take Wallace out. He tagged the back of Strickland's car, but was fortunate enough to escape. Adding to that good fortune was him now being on the tail end of the lead lap. All he needed was one more caution to get back on track, and on a day where a record 20 of them came out, it wouldn't take long. Bobby Hill and going up in flames would be just the break he needed, and after a pit stop for some fresh Goodyears, the Kodiak ride was back in business. He would once again be mired around 10th for much of the late going, stuck on the bottom lane having to rely on cars having trouble to take advantage and gain positions. But after a single car spin, he found himself in the lead by way of more pit strategy and had to hold off the pack for a few more laps. Darrell Waltrip would overtake Jeff Bodine for second and gave Rusty a fight, but it wasn't enough as he held on for Bristol win number two and things would come full circle as Dr. Jerry Punch of all people would interview him in victory lane. And believe me, this guy would not die hard at all. All weekend he's been sick, he's been fighting that flu and the inner ear infection. Congratulations, Rusty Wallace. Well, thank you, Jerry. I'd just like to, first of all, I'd like to thank you. You helped me out a lot and all the viewers watching. You know, I was the sixth son of a gun last night and Jerry gave me some medicine, got me going and it sure got me up right for today and i really like to thank him. It would be just two years later for Rusty's next win here and a new chapter in his career. He made the move to drive for famed owner Roger Penske and showcased one of the most iconic looks in all of NASCAR, especially in the 90s. This particular race in the spring of 1991 was interesting to say the least. For a steady period of time, teams weren't allowed to change tires under caution in Bristol, but that all changed this season. However, to split up the field and avoid total calamity on pit road, NASCAR came up with an idea of dividing the cars into even and odd groups. If you had an odd numbered pit stall, you pitted with the rest of those drivers. Even numbered pit stall teams pitted with their respective group. In turn, every restart would be odd pit stall cars on the inside, even cars on the outside. You thought double file restarts weren't put into play in a points race until 2009? Think again, it was 1991. Safe to say this rule didn't stick around very long, for obvious reasons. As the race began, Rusty led the field to the green and took charge. But with every caution, he had to deal with the outside lane, specifically Ricky Rudd. Every single restart, Rudd would get the jump and take command, only to surrender it right back within seconds, knowing Rusty had the faster car. I mean, seriously, what was the point of this? It got to a point where it was just comical. It seemed like it would be a relatively calm day for Rusty, showing consistently he had the car to run up front. But of course, it's never that easy. Suddenly, he felt as if a tire was going down. He tried filling it out for a couple laps, but ultimately decided to come in and fix the situation. He would lose two laps in the process, but thankfully had all day to make it up. Except there's one problem. With a new double file restart rule, lap cars could no longer restart on the inside lane next to the lead lap cars. They had to start behind them, with no free pass rule. With this scenario, if you go a lap down, your chance to win is essentially over. So what did Rusty do? Well, the only way to restart at the front of the pack was to stay out and be on the tail end of either the lead lap or however many laps down you are. Rusty elected to go that route, but had to make an unscheduled stop shortly after, neutralizing that strategy and giving a lap right back. Rex kept piling up, but he just could not find a way back in contention. The laps were ticking down, going over the 300 mark, 
still two laps down. Rusty was becoming an afterthought, but at last, while staying out again to restart at the front, a quick caution came out allowing him to gain a lap back, but time was not on his side. He needed another break and fast. With lead lap cars getting fewer and fewer, he was still able to pit and restart further and further up in the field, like in the top five as far as the order goes. And if he could be within sight of the leader, a caution could give him the opportunity to get back on the lead lap. But now a new wrench got thrown in the whole thing, rain so much that the race had to be delayed. However, the race eventually resumed. A lot of NASCAR fans remember Sterling Marlin's car igniting into a fireball in this race, giving him some gruesome burns. But what took place behind the curtain was Rusty getting back on the lead lap in the process and putting him back in contention. He was technically seventh in the running order, but with this circus restart rule, he was the first lead lap car with an odd pit stall, meaning he would restart on the front row next to Ernie Irvin. They would duel it out for the last 20 laps, getting more intense with every half mile, and this would be the end result. The white flag is out. One more lap to go for Rusty Wallace. Let's see how he handles the traffic ahead of him. Bill Elliott is right there. Rusty Wallace moving high off the second corner, leading down the backstretch. Ernie Irvin will try to make a final move. He taps Rusty. Here they come off the corner. They're side by side. It looks like Rusty Wallace is going to win by a Out of all nine of Rusty's wins at Bristol, this had to be the most impressive. From two laps down and constantly buried in the middle of the pack with just over a hundred to go to this just speaks volumes to how strong his car was and how determined they were to get the win that day. Now let's get to 1993 and what would be Rusty's first win on the concrete surface. It would be a somber atmosphere at the racetrack that morning as just three days earlier, Alan Kowicki tragically lost his life flying to the racetrack. It dampered the mood of everyone from fans to officials to the media and, of course, his fellow competitors. Rusty was visibly toned down in the pre-race but gained focus knowing he wanted to win in Allen's honor. He would start from the pole once again on a green racetrack where the sky was fittingly crying over the weekend. Although Brett Bodine got the jump on the start and took the lead, Rusty would take command just a few laps later and set the pace. It would simply just be his day. He spent most of the race in the number one spot 374 laps to be exact, and his elite pit crew came through for him every time they were needed. At one point, a lap car threw him off his rhythm, causing Mark Martin to pounce and take away the lead. But things like that just happen at Bristol. Lap cars are constantly in the way. In fact, it really didn't matter a whole lot what took place under Green because as long as Rusty was within striking distance of the leader, his crew would just smoke everybody else during pit stops and launch him back out front for the next restart uncontested. As most races go at Bristol, the carnage was left and right. Rusty definitely had to survive a lot of chaos, but it was never an issue for him. Mark would prove to be his toughest competition, trading the lead with him a couple times, but he would fade late in the going and ultimately pit for a tire rub, taking him out of contention. In the final few restarts, Rusty took full advantage of being the leader and would escape the field by getting past the lap cars on the inside and getting to the bottom where all the grip was and leaving everybody else in the dust. All he had to do was survive one last restart with 16 to go, and Dale Earnhardt was no match for him. As he took the checkered flag, he promptly saluted his fallen friend, taking a Polish victory lap while acknowledging the fans and giving the racing community something to smile about, even if they weren't a Rusty Wallace fan. Just over a year later, his first fall win at Bristol would take place, and he would bring out the big guns, the chassis Midnight. Rusty won a whopping 10 races in 93, eight of them coming with this chassis, and with two short track wins and 94 under its belt, it's safe to say the Miller team had a good feeling about this night. They rolled off the grid fourth, but unlike the previous Bristol wins, they wouldn't start out spectacular. The car still needed to be dialed in, but Rusty just bided his time and hung inside the top five. Rusty's pit crew was still at the top of their game, but coming off a shaky performance a week before at Michigan, they wanted to redeem themselves. It's safe to say they did that, sending him out either holding the position he had or gaining and coming out with a lead. Jeff Gordon became one less threat Rusty had to worry about as he was taken out over 200 laps in by Bodine. But even though Rusty led occasionally, Bodine still had the better car. With this being the final year of the tire wars in NASCAR, his Hoosiers seemed to be the difference. There were a lot of concerns how long they could last before wearing and falling off, but to that point, they were doing their job and putting the seven car in position to win. It was gonna take a bad break by Bodine and his team to give Rusty a true chance. And wouldn't you know it, with just over 50 to go, 
Jeff reported that he feared the car was running out of water and the engine was running hot. He tried riding it out and making it last as long as possible, but pretty soon, smoke was trailing out of the rear and the race fell in Rusty's lap. Hey, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. And after a late caution for Dick Trickle crashing, all he needed was one more clutch pit stop by the Miller crew and he had it in the bag. He restarted with a lead and all he had to do was hold off a hard charging Mark Martin. In this race, one year prior, Rusty led over 400 laps but was unable to close it out due to fatigue. This time, he wouldn't let that happen. Lap traffic nearly jeopardized him at the end, but he held off a six car and got checkered flag number five. One more to go. Let's see how Wallace and Martin end this thing off of the second corner and Rusty Wallace goes to the inside of Ken Schrader. So is Martin. But Rusty Wallace is going to win it. Here's the checkered flag. Wallace wins. This same race two years later would be a master class put on by Rusty. He started fifth, but this year he didn't waste any time. He made quick work of Terry Labonte, Mark Martin, and by lap 100, overtook the lead from Jeff Gordon. Jeff wouldn't go away easily at first, and keep in mind he was just scratching the surface on the dynasty he terrorized the series with in the late 90s. But overall, there wasn't much he could do. I wish there was more to talk about, but Rusty made that difficult here. Just total domination, lap after lap. His crew chief, Robin Pemberton, was just telling him to be smooth and manage his tires and stay in rhythm. When your crew chief is saying things like that and your pit crew is doing stuff like this during the race, things are going pretty well. His pit stops weren't as lightning fast as previous years, but they didn't have to be. The car was so hooked up, Rusty could quickly retake control and gain back what little track position he might have lost on pit road. In the closing laps, he had some pretty sizable lap traffic to work with, allowing Gordon to close in somewhat but it was going to take a straight up roadblock to actually make a race winning move. Rusty navigated it just fine and cruised to his sixth win at the Concrete Bull Ring and officially arrived as one of the best to ever do it at this place. In victory lane, having just turned 40 days before, he simply stated what everyone already knew, he was getting better with age. 40 a week ago, you're just getting better with age. I think we're getting better with age. Him and I were 40, we're getting pretty good at it, pal. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Let's move on to the spring of 1999, where Rusty would go for win number seven. You wouldn't believe it by seeing the sky, but it had just got done raining all morning, which washed all the rubber off the track from the bush race and made it harder to find grip, and the race was briefly delayed to dry the track. The Miller team took a bold risk and brought a brand new car to the track, but the results were already ideal. They started on pole and were fast in practice all weekend. Rusty would assume control from the start, having no problem clicking off laps. He would reach a milestone early, eclipsing 2,500 laps led at Bristol. But not too long after lap 25, he would encounter some heavy lap traffic, even more of an obstacle than usual at this track. He had a rather difficult time getting around most cars, most notably Steve Park. But Rusty chose to be patient and methodical, rather than reckless and putting himself in harm's way. A much needed caution came out, allowing the field to reset and give him wide open racetrack to pull away and continue to set the pace but eventually he wound up stuck behind the back bumper of Park again, who flat out just refused to get out of the way. They tried negotiating with Park spotter Ty Norris, but to no avail. After way too many laps and during this predicament, Rusty started getting tight and allowed Tony Stewart to overtake the lead after Rusty led every single lap until that point. He would only drop as far as third, however, and was able to retake control after a set of pit stops under caution. Stewart was easily his biggest threat all day, lurking behind and waiting to make his move but Rusty was able to hold serve, keeping his rhythm and the 20 car at bay. He had a scare midway through, having to narrowly avoid a spinning Jerry Nadeau, but that was just a foreshadowing of what would transpire a bit later. Nadeau would once again spin right in front of the leaders, wiping out two stout contenders in Stewart and Jeff Gordon. Luckily for Rusty, not only did he sneak by unscathed, but two of his toughest competitors were no longer filling up his rearview mirror. It seemed like his problems were all but gone by this point, just needing to take care of his equipment and hit his marks. Dale Jarrett would have something to say to that, though, as he slightly ate into Rusty's lead as the laps went down under 50. A spin by Steve Park himself would change all that, however, and with just over 20 to go, Jarrett had a long-run car, virtually ending his chances having to pit for new tires. They restarted with 18 to go, and Mark Martin would be all over the back of the Blue Deuce for the entirety of it. He cranked up the pressure to a significant level, just waiting for one mistake by Rusty, but given his clean and respectful driving style, he was going to do it fair and square or not at all. Rusty had trouble getting off of turn two, 
allowing Mark to get runs, but not enough to make the pass. By the end, Rusty was able to hold off a blazing Valvoline Ford and turn another Polish victory lap around the Coliseum after leading a jaw-dropping 425 of 500 laps. The final two triumphs for Rusty at the world's fastest half mile came in a sweep of the year 2000. In the first of two chapters, Pemberton and the guys brought another brand new car off the hauler. But unlike the year before, they didn't see the instant results they wanted. They spent all of final practice making a total overhaul of the setup, all the way down to the shocks and springs. Rusty started a solid sixth, but honestly he wasn't a factor early on. He started losing spots quickly, and the car was just too loose. On the first pit stop, they made a flurry of adjustments. I'm talking sway bar, air pressure, wedge, you name it. Things began to improve, but his ceiling was about sixth. But at just over 200 laps, when leader Dale Earnhardt was taken out in somebody else's mess not of his doing, the whole complexion of the race changed. Rusty was suddenly inside the top five and not far from the lead. How did he get there? This miller Lite crew was young and not as experienced, but they blazed out a 15.1 second stop to launch the two car into contention. That's right, folks. That was a super fast pit stop in those days. Rusty's Ford Taurus kept getting better, and as a result of testing and his teammate Jeremy Mayfield and the 12 team working together on their notes instead of doing their own thing like in the past, Mr. Penske saw his drivers running first and second. But Rusty wanted to flip the order. I should mention now that he hadn't won a single cup race since that 99 Bristol win, which was a year ago to this race. He was hungry. Midway through, under a yellow flag pit stop, a photographer made his way behind Rusty's pit and accidentally stepped on the team's air hose, slowing the stop by about a full second. This kind of luck usually spells doom for a team, but thankfully it only costed them one spot worth of track position. But Rusty needed another break because Jeff Gordon had the fastest car and had led over 200 laps to this point. And wouldn't you know it, Jeff would hit a loose tire coming out of his pit stall and had to come back in, surrendering the lead in the process. When it's your track, it's just your track. All he needed to figure out now was how to get around his teammate, and with a blue deuce dialed into the max and handling ideally, he finally made the move going into turn three and led for the first time all day with just under 100 laps to go. He wouldn't totally be out of the woods yet with Dell Jarrett's crew outdoing them on a late pit stop and a two-tire call by Ward Burton and the Caterpillar team, but it wasn't nearly enough to hold Rusty back. He had to knock a pesky Jimmy Spencer out of the way just trying to stay on the lead lap, but once that was behind him, it was all smooth sailing. He led just 86 laps that day, but this happened to be Rusty's 50th career win. It was eluding him for a year, but the wait was well worth it. He was a lot more animated in victory lane than usual, and you could tell this meant a lot to him. How fitting that it happened in his personal paradise. It meant so much to me. Now I tried for so long to get that number 50, and I got it at my favorite racetrack. Uh, Will there be a very small party, Rusty? You kidding, man? I'm sponsored by a beer company, for Christ's sakes. But it's going to be contained, and nobody's going to be driving. It's going to be right down at the infield of my bus, and we're going to have a rock and roll time. All right. You tell him, Rusty. He proved that day that it wasn't a case of Rusty getting old, but it was the Rusty of old. In the back end of the sweep and the final win at Bristol in his career, he set the track record in qualifying and led the 43-car field to the green. In the early going, he had no problems, cruising out front and putting down laps with Jeff Gordon lurking not far behind. The race had a choppy rhythm early on, with spins and crashes happening often. Rusty led almost the entire first 150 laps with the exception of a few cars staying out under caution for strategy. He had no problem getting back around them, but Rusty's car was loose in the first two runs. At about lap 150, his car got totally out of shape off turn two and had to let Tony Stewart go by. Tony would run off and take command for a while, showing he had the car to beat at the time. Midway through the race, an extremely rare occurrence at Bristol happened. Green flag pit stops. It's obvious why you rarely see it, and they're pretty nerve-wracking considering a caution could come out at any time, trapping you a lap down. But everyone cycled through with no hiccup, and Rusty eventually picked up where he left off in second. Eventually, another caution would come out just before halfway, and we would find out if the changes his crew made were enough to challenge the 20 car. At first, it looked to be the case as lap traffic would clog up the track and allow Rusty to close, but as the run went on, he was still getting loose and allowed Mark Martin to get by, dropping him to third. This had to be concerning, knowing that the Miller Lot team still had a ways to go before they could contend. But on the next pit stop, having that first pit stall paid off and Rusty got out front ahead of Tony and Mark, putting him back in the driver's seat. It looked like this was just the break he needed, but of course there would be a few more obstacles. 
Rusty held the lead all the way till just over 100 to go when under caution, Stewart decided to stay out and take a gamble. He would actually make a gap to Rusty on the restart, but after a fiery crash involving Robert Presley, it gave Rusty another chance to pounce. With lap cars all around, he was able to drop to the inside and take the lead back with Tony's older tires not able to hold up. He took off from the field once again, but there would be one more hurdle. On the last pit stops, Ward Burton took just two tires and went for the win, or at least a top five. But it wasn't near enough, as Rusty made quick work of him in a matter of four laps to take over for good. He led 279 laps and finished the job one more time, capping off his illustrious record at the last great Coliseum with win number nine. Final lap for Rusty Wallace, 44 years of age. Comes up on the rear, the lap car of Jeff Gordon, and the checkered flag will weigh for Rusty Wallace. He takes his fourth win of the season, his 53rd career victory, and his ninth win at Bristol Motor Speedway. Father Time would catch up to Rusty after the season, only winning two more times in his last five seasons. But he wasn't ending the consistent winning portion of his career without reminding the racing landscape how truly gifted he was at Bristol. His accumulated and final stats there are 9 wins, 22 top 5s, 29 top 10s, 3,723 laps led, an average finish of 9.6, and perhaps the second most impressive stat, just 3 DNFs. Bristol was a demolition derby of a track in that era, and he only fell victim to it three times in over 20 years. I think what makes Rusty's resume here so impressive is this wasn't the finesse Bristol with multi-groove racing today. In this era of Bristol, it was a one-groove racetrack, and if you weren't in that groove, you were in trouble. The only way you could get around someone is wait for them to make a mistake and take advantage or move them out of the way yourself. It also wore on drivers physically, having to make a thousand turns a race while having your head on a swivel dodging all the chaos. Sometimes you got caught in other driver's mess, sometimes you were the mess, and sometimes your temper just got the best of you. This track could make or break careers, and only the strongest survive. In most of Rusty's wins, he wasn't beating himself or digging himself a hole. His team rarely made mistakes, and he was always running at or near the front waiting to strike. He just had a knack for this kind of racing, and he put every single bit of it to use. Anytime the Cup Series made their way to a short track, you had to put him down as a car to look out for by default because he was always in the picture. And just think, if it wasn't for Jeff Gordon, he could have had two more wins here. I know, that's the elephant in the room. But two bump and runs compared to the rest of his work is minuscule. All you have to do is gaze up the Rusty Wallace Terrace in turns three and four, and you know he left a permanent mark at Bristol. It was worth documenting. Well, that's it for this one, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to leave a like and subscribe like your life depends on it. This has been a Platinum Paradise video.